Welcome to today's program titled Protecting Trade Secrets in the Pharmaceutical Industry in the Age of COVID-19. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged in to the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the text box on your screen. We will not have time to do question and answers today due to the time constraints, but all your questions will be answered in the days following today's webinar. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on all CLE attendance affirmation forms. Please write this code down. It will not be reread, and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Catherine Pirelli. You may begin. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're pleased that you could join us today and um, look forward to chatting about this topic that is uh, particularly timely, given what we're all going through. Um, I wanted to take a, a moment and, and introduce our panelists and then talk a little bit about why we assembled this group and um, uh, decided that this would be a, a good topic, um, given, the, given the circumstances of the last several months. Uh, starting first, um, with Julie McCarthy. Uh, Julie is the general counsel of the Genomic Institute of the Novartis Research Foundation, otherwise known as GNF. Um, GNF is an incredibly cool company uh, based out in the La Jolla area, um, which describes itself as a bridge between basic science and preclinical drug discovery for Novartis's global research organization, the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, NIBR. Um, Julie uh, is, is the GC, has also worked in life sciences for several years uh, um, in the Boston area, and perhaps uh, at least more importantly to the other folks on the panel, including myself, she's a SciParth alum from our Boston office, uh, and we've had the pleasure also to work with uh, Julie as a client on a number of matters. So uh, Julie, thanks so much for being on the panel with us today. Uh, next uh, on the hit parade here is Dean Finelli, who is a partner in our DC office. Uh, Dean has incredibly unique and, and relevant experience to the topic today. He has a PhD in organic chemistry, and his technical background includes R&D of amino acids containing antibiotics of last resort, and I'm not going to include the names of those because um, I probably can't pronounce them, um, but including um, uh, uh, MRSA, which is, I think, um, familiar term to, to most of us. Dean's legal practice spans the chemical, pharma, and biotechnical biotech industries. His skill set includes assisting clients with transactions, patent protection, and FDA law. <clears throat> and his experience with the pharma, pharmaceutical chemical technologies includes work with new chemical entities, pharma formulations, bio, bio, biologics, diagnostics, and medical devices. Uh, and he also regularly handles IP issues attendant to mergers and acquisitions and financing for, uh, for life science companies. Uh, so, Dean, welcome to the panel. Thanks for, for doing it. Uh, Dawn Mertnight is a litigation partner in the Boston office of Cypher Shaw, and she regularly litigates restrictive covenant and trade secret matters in state and federal courts across the country. Uh, she also advises clients on their pre-litigation practices, both for trade secret protection and restrictive covenant agreements, as well as onboarding and offboarding employees subject to such agreements. Um, so Don, thanks and, and welcome. Thanks for joining the panel. Um, myself, uh, Kate Perilli, I'm a partner in the Boston office. Uh, my practice uh, mirrors Don's practice. Uh, um, I also uh, have the pleasure and privilege of being the co-chair of Cypress Shaw's um, uh, trade secret and restrictive covenant practice. Uh, and just quickly, Seifarth Shaw has uh, about 900 lawyers worldwide. Our trade secret practice has 40 plus lawyers who devote their time to um, trade secret and restrictive covenant and um, uh, forensic matters uh, in the courts around the country. So um, just a couple of like thoughts on, on why we um, 
decided to have this um, this panel. You know, we are at a, I'll come back to this agenda in just a moment, um, but why are we here with COVID-19 and pharma in the news? You know, the idea for the seminar came in the midst of this unprecedented, at least in our lifetime, global pandemic. Uh, it's brought the, the world um, essentially to its knees. We're slowly starting to emerge in different parts of the world, thankfully. Um, but during this time, we've all been on the sidelines cheering for our healthcare workers and other essential employees, and also perhaps like never before, cheering for our pharma, biotech, life science companies as they race for treatments and vaccines and testing, um, testing for uh, this virus. And, and the industry uh, has risen to the occasion. You, you see every day in the news, both print and media, uh, we see all of the incredible efforts that this industry is going to 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 find a cure and find treatments. Um, greatest minds around the world are working on this problem right now uh, and working at a fever pitch to find those treatments and vaccines. So all of us as lawyers who deal with the, um, particularly um, the folks from CIFAR, you know, for a large part of our practice protecting trade secrets and Julie dealing with these issues from an in-house perspective, we thought this was a, a good time to bring us all together to talk um, about these issues, both from the outside counsel perspective as well as from Julie's in-house perspective. So that's why we're here. That, that was the genesis of the idea for the seminar. Let me go back to the agenda. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Farm in the News. We're then going to give you all a, a, an overview of trade secrets just real generally and then specifically in the pharma industry to give you a sense of the types of things that could qualify for trade secret protections. Uh, then we're going to talk about um, the increased risk due to this COVID-19 environment and our thoughts and tips on perhaps how to handle some of those risks and, and at least reduce them. And then finally, uh, we'll talk about um, broader notions of trade, trade secret protection protocols um, for you all to think about and uh, implement into your either your practice advice or your in-house protocols. Um, so, you know, we've all seen in the news, as I mentioned, uh, on a daily basis and more than a daily basis, all the amazing things that uh, the pharma company, pharma industry is doing. Um, uh, we just referenced a few of the, the, the particular articles that we've seen um, and reporting on the collaboration that's going on in the industry. And, and the collaboration is by some of the biggest pharma companies in the world, all the way down the, the spectrum to, to, to smaller companies uh, and startups in this area. Um, and collaboration is not new, and I'm sure Julie can, can talk to that when she speaks about, about her perspective. It's not new, particularly in the biotech uh, pharma area. There's always, there's always collaborations between companies and um, educational institutions and research institutions, but now we see uh, the fuel for that collaboration is everyone's desire to find a solution uh, as quickly as possible for this pandemic and also to prevent future pandemics. So with that, um, there's, you know, here we want to identify, we've identified what we, what we see as the five um, categories of um, increased or pronounced IP risks in this COVID environment. You know, many of us are working uh, remotely. Um, many of us will continue to work remotely into the foreseeable future till, till a cure or vaccine is found. Um, so that's going to impact um, protection of trade secrets. Furloughs and layoffs have already happened. More may occur. There's particular challenges during those. Um, I've already mentioned the increase in collaborative IP initiatives to further the relief effort, COVID relief effort. There's all kinds of competitive threats. Um, you know, obviously, there's always com competition in the market. Um, but perhaps, and uh, I think um, it, it's fair to say that those threats, competitive threats have increased. And then this, this environment has created um, challenges and hurdles to, um, to enforcing uh, protections, IP protections, particularly trade seed protections. So we're gonna, we're gonna dig down on each of those categories a little bit more as we proceed, um, but we thought, um, We'd, we'd start sort of a, and, and identify some of the things that are that are uh, facing in-house executives, uh, both business people and and the legal folks in-house. Um, and Julie, I don't know if you wanted to, to talk a little bit about some of those issues at this point before I I, I go on a little bit with it. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, 
Good morning slash good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. This is certainly a very timely topic, and I really appreciate um, the opportunity to participate in this um, in this webinar and also learn from it. From where I sit uh, in in the drug discovery research space, trade the trade secrets that we uh, want to mightily protect are things like early stage re drug discovery research, a biological databases, chemical formulas, clinical trial data, and, and much, much more than that. But those are sort of some of the, the key areas that we are very conscious of in the trade secret space as a pharma company. And I'm sure, as you can all imagine and relate to, um, this is a critical issue during normal times and a very critical pre-COVID. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, from time to time, we do have trade secrets cases uh, that involve valuable data, and we have to deal with it, um, as I said, in the normal course. But now COVID has certainly presented some, um, I think, unique challenges uh, uh, for, for in-house folks trying to protect um, trade secrets. So we're going to go over those, those today. Um, you know, one thing to put it in perspective, as Kate was saying, there are so many initiatives happening globally on various COVID treatments, um, and people really hit the ground running. I mean, within, you know, 24 hours, we had people at our, at our company who were speaking on this issue, calling collaborators, reaching out to people, even reaching out to other companies that we wouldn't necessarily collaborate with um, if it weren't a public health emergency. Um, and in doing that, people work very quickly, and they, they want to get a quick contract. Uh, they want the terms to be decided. Um, but as we all know, the devil is often in the detail. So you really have to balance the need to move with speed, which we always want to do, but also to, to just have a balance there as well because it, these are very high stakes. As I said, in the normal course of business, it's high stakes, and then in COVID, it's high stakes as well. Um, so I'm sure you all um, train your people um, and have policies and procedures in place, and people are generally mindful of those, but now is a time where, where a lot of companies are saying, should we be giving people a refresher um, so that they can think of this issue in the context of their day-to-day -day work, which might have changed. As I said, it could be that they're in five new collaborations. It could be that they're working from home, or there could be some other circumstances. So um, uh, that, I think I'm going to pass it back to Dawn, and Dawn is going to tell us a little bit of, about trade secrets and the trade secret act. Thank you, Julie. Um, before I delve into um, the definition of a trade secret, you know, the, part of the reason we wanted to highlight this issue is because one of the things we have seen in recent years is that patent protections seem to be weakened, especially in light of certain Supreme Court cases. And as a result, that makes trade secret protection even more important. So this is always an issue for companies, especially companies like pharma uh, companies, but um, even more so in recent years. Most of the people on um, who are attending this webinar are likely somewhat familiar with trade secrets, so we don't need to spend um, too much time delving into the definition. But we did want to just highlight for you the definition of a trade secret under the Trade Secrets Act of 2016, which is a federal law, relatively new. And I won't read all of this text, of course, but essentially it defines a trade secret as information that derives economic value from not being known to or not readily ascertainable through normal means by someone in the industry. Um, and the owner of the trade secret has to keep um, the, the secret, uh, the information secret, and has to take reasonable measures to do so. Now, that's just the Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act, but most states, actually every state in the country except for New York, has a similar statute, and most of them define um, trade secret in a substantially identical way. So that's the general uh, definition of a trade secret, and I am going to pass it to Dean, who can talk a little bit about, specifically in the pharma context, what might be considered a trade secret. Thanks, Dawn, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, the next couple slides, as Dawn mentioned, I will uh, discuss examples of information in the pharma and biotech in industry that uh, may be 
available for trade secrets. Now, certainly, um, it's most people are familiar with uh, research and development. There's areas of research and development that uh, are typically patented, but as Dawn and Julie alluded to earlier, uh, patent protection uh, is oftentimes not appropriate for certain things. For example, when we think about uh, processes for biologics, a lot of that information can't be ascertained very easily. So uh, you may consider uh, keeping certain information like that as a trade secret because patents obviously have a defined term of 20 years, uh, after which time uh, the information uh, is in the public domain. But more importantly, uh, when you file your patent application, you have to provide a written description in there. And oftentimes that written description, uh, that roadmap that you're providing in your patent application may not be appropriate or you may not want that information available to your competitors. So certainly with regard to research and development, oftentimes we'll see a final product that's the subject of uh, patent protection. But in certain instances, uh, the intermediates, tangible products such as intermediates or um, pro-drugs, they may be considered uh, trade secrets, even if it's just for a time while you're considering a life cycle management uh, where a final product may be patented and then a, the intermediates or pro-drugs that maybe targets of future development may be considered a trade secret uh, either in the long term or for a period of time where you'd file a patent application to them at a later time to, as I mentioned, increase that life cycle of the patented uh, drug. So, of course, processes um, can be subject to trade secrets. You may um, oftentimes, especially when we're thinking of biologics, uh, small molecule Syntheses are pretty standard and can be ascertained uh, pretty readily. But on the biologic side, in many instances, you could have the same, uh, you can know the product, know the process, and do it at different facilities. And if there are slight variations, you can get a completely different product. So uh, keeping that information as a trade secret uh, can provide a tremendous competitive advantage over uh, competitors. Um, as Dawn mentioned, generally trade secret information is um, is available for information that's not known to the public, that provides a competitive advantage to the company, and is subject to reasonable efforts to maintain it as a secret. So um, on the R&D side, that is typically straightforward, but also on the, the business side, uh, market analyses, um, if you're looking at uh, a potential competitor or a other company as an acquisition target that could be that information could be a trade secret because it'll provide a competitive advantage um, even uh, financial information on profitability and potential profitability of drugs uh, could be available as a trade secret um, when we a lot of information that is known to the scientists we consider know-how residing with that individual. We're, we're residing with a, a team of individuals working on research. Much of that information, that know-how, can be kept as a trade secret. Um, for example, uh, personnel information, uh, identification of new opportunities and emerging markets. Um, some other examples of trade secrets, though, are uh, manufacturing, industrial, or commercial secrets, um, supplier and client lists, sales and distribution methods. Uh, so there's, it's important to note that not uh, any kind of information is eligible for trade secret protection as long as it's protected, it's, con it's kept confidential, and there's active means uh, that a company takes to keep that information confidential. So on the next slide, um, this is a typical R&D development pathway that most companies would take uh, from drug discovery through uh, commercialization and, and, and post-launch as well. So without going through the entire slide, the idea here is there's at each instance, whether you're preclinical, in the clinic, or even after um, commercial launch uh, as a, a phase four study or, or uh, identifying new indications, there's a lot of areas during the drug discovery pathway that allow for potential trade secret uh, protection. 
Now, one of the things to um, pay particularly close attention to is um, the center of the slide, the approval uh, fees. Um, it's very important there. Oftentimes, um, you know, scientists are becoming much uh, more savvy and they're being trained in-house. But oftentimes, you know, the idea is to have them focusing exclusively on the on the science and on the research. So it's critical that regulatory personnel who liaise with scientists and collect the data from scientists uh, properly inform the scientists of what what can potentially be a trade secret. What's the strategy the company is using for their their complete IP package of what what are we going after as a patent? Uh, just to so as scientists are doing these studies and doing the research, they know um, what should be kept secret and what should not be disclosed because it's in science a scientist's nature um, when they're doing research to share this research, um, to publish their research and to share it with competitors. Uh, and of course, that advances science incrementally uh, and ultimately uh, advances the science overall, but it obviously can have a detriment to the company uh, if secrets are, trade secrets are disclosed. So when we think about the regular, excuse me, regulatory approval pathway, at the approval um, instance, when you're filing your new drug application, your biologic application with the FDA, certain information in that's included in your application uh, for approval may be considered proprietary or trade secret information. So it's critical that that information is uh, marked as a trade secret or marked as proprietary because uh, the public under the Freedom of Information Act can get access to uh, certain documents uh, that are not marked um, trade secret. So if you decide that uh, to include trade secrets in an FDA filing, uh, you can make them exempt from a freedom of information request by identifying them in the filing and uh, being particular of where that information is included. So uh, it's critical to remember that so that information that's included in your regulatory application doesn't inadvertently get disclosed to the public and thereby um, uh, losing your trade secret information. Um, on the biologic side, uh, and here I could imagine in many instances where trade secrets have a tremendous amount of value, even greater than patents, because uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you're doing creating your biologic, often slight variations uh, in storage and the method of manufacturing could have vast um, uh, prob cause vast problems in the actual product development. So everything has to be done in a particular way. You could have storage and delivery conditions that are proprietary that if not known, um, that would provide a competitive advantage over your uh, third parties. So all of this information here, whether it's the sequence identity, the cell lines used or the media conditions used, uh, lot to lot variations, all this information provides a tremendous amount of uh, competitive advantage over uh, for example, a, a another company that wanted to create a biosimilar version of an existing biologic. Uh, so this information, by keeping it secret, can provide an enormous barrier to market entry for a competitor. And it's also important to think that um, with the trade secret and with the, the market exclusivity associated with a biologic application, uh, these are valuable and oftentimes more valuable than patent rights. So it's very important when you're developing your intellectual property strategy to consider the long-term aspects of, you know, when will this patent, when is my product going to come to market? When are we filing our patent application? When will the patent application once issued as a patent, when will that expire? Uh, is it worth uh, foregoing the patent route and keeping things as a trade secret? And on the biologic side, I could see that in many instances that that would be an advantage. So I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Kate Pirelli to talk about misappropriation now. Great. Thanks, Dean. Um, really helpful information to think about as they're going through the, the pathway that you laid out in that slide. Um, so just, just to turn to the sort of the protection side of this and the, the legal remedies, legal protections, Don mentioned the definition of a trade secret under the Defend Trade Secret Act, it was, which was the, the new federal law that went into effect in uh, 16, I believe. Um, 
uh, under under that particular uh, statute, federal cause of action, um, there these are the elements. I certainly won't read this entire slide to you, but um, the elements necessary to, to show that a misappropriation of a trade secret has occurred, um, you know, which my common sense notion, someone who's acquired it, acquired the trade secret when he, when he or she knew or should have known that it was acquired by improper means or it's disclosed or used that trade secret without express or implied consent. Um, and then you see the other other elements to that. Uh, obviously, that's the first the first mechanism or first set of elements that you'll have to, to show to show that something's been misappropriated. But equally important and, and um, maybe perhaps most important in this analysis by courts is that the companies uh, must be able to show, and there are other, um, other uh, statutes under state law um, that provide similar um, definitions of misappropriation that are very similar to the federal TPSA claim. But under both federal and state law, whatever um, particular provision you are moving under for protection, um, the company is going to have to show that they've kept their trade secrets a, a secret. Um, certainly, publicly available information is not going to be considered a trade secret. So again, in this context of collaboration and the race for um, medical solutions to what's going on with COVID, there, a lot of uh, these collaborations are talking about making information publicly available uh, for the greater good, obviously, and, and I'm sure there will be great thought and selection as to what is made public, what is not. Uh, but once something is pu public, the extent that, it, that the uh, company was trying to have trade secret protection around that, a public, a public statement of that or reveal of that, will lose that protection. Um, the other key piece to this is, um, to, the, to the keeping it secret is, you know, courts will take a look to see what reasonable precautions have has a company put in place to um, to maintain secrecy, um, and um, you know, there's notions of. Um, let me go to the next slide here because this next, I come back to this next point on the slide. But um, you know, what's what's required to, to um, uh, in the legal world to keep something secret is that, um, absolute secrecy and heroic measures are, are typically not required, uh, and only only ones that are uh, particular, particularly reasonable under the circumstances. This notion of proportionality that's in the law that <clears throat> you know, various circumstances are ta taken into account. You know, what is the trade secret? What is it that you're trying to protect? And what mechanisms would make sense given the company size, um, you know, uh, uh, revenues available to it or, or uh, value of the company? What What's what's proportional in terms of an investment to protect that trade secret? And that's going to vary trade secret by trade secret and uh, company by company. So those are all things that, that should be taken into account as you put your protections in place that someday if you're trying to seek protection from a court, they're going to take a look at the, at the precautions that you've taken. And, and there's, we'll get later, later in this program um, on the types of things that um, should be done to, um, to, to take those proportional steps. We all kind of joked about this dog with the Superman um, cape on, and that's not a, a Cyforth logo attempt, but um, just a, a, <laughs> uh, a mechanism, I guess, to show that, that we all need to be uh, careful and keep our secret secret. Um, just to go back, just to, um, for the trial folks out there, the people who have trials coming up, and this is a pretty obvious notion, but disclosure of trade secrets at trial without um, protections uh, taken in the in the court proceeding through protective orders or impoundment, impoundment motions um, will uh, compromise and, and perhaps defeat a claim that your information is a trade secret. So counsel will work very closely with you and with the court to make sure and, and opposing parties to make sure that those uh, trade secrets that are at issue in a piece of litigation are protected um, from disclosure. Um, I'm going to, um, we're going to we're going to segue into keep things moving here because we're about halfway through the program. Um, talk about the increase in these increased risks of co uh, during COVID and and how to handle them. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Dawn to talk about the remote work environment. 
Thanks. And uh, since we're just about halfway through the program, now is a good time to give out the CLE code. Um, so I'll do that right now. Uh, the code for this program is SS, as in Seifarth Shaw, 2212. So again, that's S as in Seifarth, S as in Shaw, 2212. So the first challenge that we identified is, of course, the remote work environment. Um, just about every state has either issued um, a stay-at-home advisory or an order, um, and even beyond the actual state actions, we've seen large percentages of the workforce working remotely now, much more so than has ever been the case. And even as some of those advisories or orders are expiring, we are still seeing a good chunk of the workforce staying at home so that folks can properly social distance. Um, and, and it's going to be probably quite some time before we see everyone back in the office as we typically did before the pandemic, if that ever happens. Um, as a result, companies and employees alike may be tempted to relax some of their policies and procedures. Uh, companies may look for workarounds um, other than their typical security protocols in the hope that it will be easier for their employees to work from home and be productive. Uh, and likewise, employees may try to take shortcuts or um, implement measures that aren't quite up to their typical security standards to make work from home a little bit easier so that they have documents in front of them, uh, even if they're not in their office environment. Now, obviously, in addition to those factors, companies often don't know whether their employees' home networks are <clears throat> excuse me, quite as secure as the in-office network, and typically it's not quite as secure. Um, as a result, um, there may be some threats or just general unknowns to the company. Um, we also all presumably have heard of the phenomenon of Zoom bombing. Zoom is a, a video conferencing platform that has exploded since the pandemic. Um, and while they have recently implemented some security measures, there have been a number of uh, articles written and blogs about certain security concerns with that platform and other platforms too. Other um, video conferencing platforms have different security measures and features. And um, as a result, there has been some concern with meetings that have been held through this online platform as opposed to in-person. It used to be that if you had an in-person meeting, you could clearly see who was present in the room. You can ensure that no one is recording on their phone or you can be fairly certain that they're not recording on their phone, not taking uh, notes surreptitiously. And in this new environment, you can't see that necessarily. They might be recording. They might have someone in the room next to them um, who is listening, but it's off camera. Um, so all of that is a new challenge that companies have to deal with. In addition to that, employees might be using personal devices, uh, again, in an effort to make things easier for themselves, but that may increase the risk of misappropriation later. And Julie, I don't know if you wanted to um, chime in here at all to talk about what you may have seen or um, concerns that you have from an in-house perspective about what employees are doing while they're working remotely. Yeah, thanks, Don. Yeah, so as I said, you know, um, Information security is very, very critical for all companies, including pharma. And it, I'll get back to what Dean was talking about, you know, that first market entry, the competitive nature of this field. And the goal is to maintain that competitive advantage and get to market first um, and gain your, gain your market share. Uh, so, but with the work from home, which uh, in my experience, it was, it was rolled out rather quickly and quite effectively also, um, but as it was happening, I'm not so sure that all of our employees were being conscious about what they're doing with paper documents at their home. For example, are they, are they shredding them? Were they on the lookout for um, phishing schemes? Now, we, we train our people on phishing schemes on a regular basis, um, but while they're at home, could it be more of a relaxed environment, as Don was saying, and people are more prone to um, open an email that they shouldn't, that then just raise all your data. Uh, the, the sensitive um, level of information that is, say, that is um, shared on 
you know, uh, phone calls, um, video conferences. You have to think about who's in the environment with the person. If you're talking about a very critical asset or perhaps a very critical farmer project um, that has, has a really important juncture and you need to make some, some decisions, um, you don't want that information to be overheard by a third party. I mean, we would always think about that in terms of airports and the like, but now you're actually at home and are there people around you? And it's not that unusual for you know, two scientists to work, who are married to work at two different companies. I mean, there are those kind of um, tensions mm -hmm. there. So it could be that the, in fact, the partner of someone is, is a competitor um, and, and query what they're hearing or seeing um, by working, in some cases, back to back. I've seen some spouses in, in shared offices at home because everyone's looking for space and trading off on conference call, one, you know, one and then the other. Um, another thing with the smart devices, I, you know, the, the theft of trade secrets is ever increasing according to all of our law enforcement. And if there was a, a company or a particular nation that wanted to, as a predator during this time, is there a way to exploit a smart device like Alexa or Google Home such that it's actually in listening mode? Um, I know it sounds like a little far-fetched, but I do think that now in 2020, that's really the environment we're working on. And there's a lot of creativity uh, in how you can steal something and um, might seem kind of, oh, you know, that's unlikely to happen. But if someone wants to get access to your data, which is very, very valuable, perhaps that's an avenue that they would, that they would go down. Um, around this time, too, I would recommend that people have your IT group look at some of the logs um, of access from your employees if they don't normally do so. Uh, it might be that there's certain red flags that come up, red flags that come up when a ton of data is downloaded, um, and that's kind of the normal course. But right now, it might be worthwhile to start doing some spot checks on that to see if there's anything unusual, unusual happening. I think at that point, I would like to turn this back over to, to Kate. Actually, we're, I'm going to then flip it to Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good segue, though, Julie, um, some of the, the tips that you gave, because that brings us to um, our, our proposed best practices. Um, and we, you'll see we have this split up. For those that are continuing to, rem to work remotely, um, there are a number of things that we recommend. The first is that um, each employer should carefully choose the appropriate video conference platform. As I mentioned, um, we've seen some articles about Zoom, but there are, as I also said, other platforms have their own um, features and drawbacks. You know, there are a ton of platforms out there, BlueJeans, WebEx, I could go on and on. So it's uh, incumbent upon the employer to do some research and make sure that they're choosing um, an appropriate platform wisely and making sure that they have the security bells and whistles that they need, even if that's going to be more expensive. And it's also important when the platform is chosen that the company informs the employees to only use the approved platforms when they're talking about confidential and trade secret information and to use the highest security settings. Um, this will be a theme throughout the rest of this program, but of course, we always suggest that employers remind their employees of com their confidentiality obligations. That becomes even more important when they're not in the office on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in addition to having um, your typical confidentiality obligations and other restrictive covenants agreements, it's also important in this environment to have written policies for remote working um, to the extent your company doesn't already have that. Now is certainly the time to implement them. And that will include um, a prohibition on sharing documents, whether with other parties or even ex you know, internally. Um, we see a lot of times somebody will send something to their Gmail account because it's easier to access that way. Um, and you really need to have written protocols about when that is prohibited. Um, it's also useful to ask your employees what devices they're using at home that will help you figure out what security concerns you might have. And if in the long run, um, if an employee ends up leaving, you can have a sense of where documents might be stored. 
And then again, only allowing access through secure connections, VPN with encryption, and um, for employees who are dealing with confidential information and trade secrets, prohibiting working from a public place um, that would have public Wi-Fi. So then for returning to work, there are also some best practices that we have here, um, again, reminding your employees of their obligations. But in addition, we recommend um, instructing employees that they should return any hard copy documents. So that could be a document that they printed on their home printer or handwritten notes and make sure that those documents, to the extent they have any sensitive information in them, come back to the office. Um, in addition to the extent employees did use um, personal emails or other devices to access documents, they should be asked to identify where those documents are and ideally delete them. And finally, in cases of employees who are critical and who have access to the, the, the jewels to the kingdom, you may consider having them sign a certification that says that they have not kept any hard copy documents at their home or that they have um, deleted any copies on their personal devices and have not disseminated them. So sort of um, in the same vein, uh, we have another challenge here, furloughs and layoffs. Um, obviously with the economic downturn, we have all heard of the employment rate skyrocketing and companies are furloughing employees for weeks or even months. And that presents its own challenges. There may be disgruntled employees who are looking to harm their uh, former employer. It may also be that there are employees who, uh, or former employees who aren't necessarily um, looking to do any bad conduct, but they're looking for a new job with a competitor. And they may not realize that the information that they are bringing to a competitor is a trade secret, is confidential, and they may just be looking to get a leg up in the interview process. Um, but that obviously presents a challenge as well. One of the things we see in states where non-competes are enforceable is that a lot of companies will use them as sort of a, a backstop for trade secret protection. So obviously you'll have confidentiality, provisions in an employment agree agreement, but you may also have non-competes um, for those employees to protect trade secrets uh, to an even greater extent. But in many states, non-competes are not enforceable against employees who have been laid off. So that's another challenge to consider. And then finally, there is sometimes a delay in receiving back the company issued computers and cell phones and other electronic assets that would allow you to conduct a forensic analysis to see if the departing employee has engaged in any bad conduct. So how do you deal with that? Um, again, I know I sound like a broken record, but you want to consistently remind employees and departing employees in particular of their confidentiality obligations. And that may include having them sign a separation agreement reaffirming their obligations, not just confidentiality, but in some cases, um, non-compete that they are subject to them. Um, you also want to consider sending a letter or an email to the new employer saying, we understand that this former employee of ours has joined your company. Um, we trust that you are aware of his or her obligations to maintain the confidentiality of our trade secret information, and we expect that you will respect that information. Um, the other thing to do uh, when employees are leaving is to conduct exit interviews. Again, this might be difficult in the COVID environment where people aren't in the office uh, and you don't have a one-to-one -one in person meeting, um, but we recommend doing it by video conference. And part of the reason for that is because when you're on video with someone, it's easier to tell if they are, um, they appear disgruntled or if it seems like they might be hiding something, it can often be easier um, if you're looking at the person and having a conversation with them. And then again, as I said, it might be difficult to promptly get back the company assets, but we do advise um, when employees are leaving that you request the information or the, the devices back quickly, whether it's a phone or a computer, and then um, you can have a forensic image made. Whether you're actually doing a full-blown examination is a different question, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it is important to get the company assets back and make sure they are secured. So next, I think Dean is going to handle the uh, collaborative IP initiatives. And as the yeah, thank you, Dawn. 
as the keeper of the time, we have about uh, 15 minutes left. I just want to alert the panelists to that. Okay, thanks, Sure. So when we're, um, there's a tremendous amount of collaboration going on. Uh, we're really, um, I mean, it's trite to say we're in unprecedented times, but really the only way we're going to get back to a, a normal situation where we can go back to going to concerts, going to sports events, going to large gatherings uh, safely is uh, with the development of a vaccine. Now, vaccine development is a very uh, tedious and typically a very long-term uh, developmental process. But there, the and it's only with this collaboration that uh, we're going to bring a vaccine to the public uh, in a timely fashion. So. Um, on this slide, there's uh, just a few examples of the collaborations going on. Um, ACTIVE is a, um, it's coordinated by the Foundations for the National Institutes of Health, and it brings together government, governmental organizations, academia, uh, philanthropic organizations, and, and perhaps most importantly, um, competitive companies, biopharmaceutical companies that typically compete against each other uh, are now collaborating to uh, try and bring this vaccine to market. Um, everyone's probably heard uh, Dr. Fauci talk about uh, we'll have a vaccine hopefully in 2021. Well, the typical time frame, you know, you're talking four years um, on average. And sometimes, you know, if you think about the context of HIV, there's still no uh, vaccine for that disease. So um, it's it's really an unprecedented uh, collaboration that's it's really inspiring to see these companies come together uh, but the thing to remember is with this collaboration and with these scientists um, freely uh, promoting their ideas and uh, gathering together uh, they they are still members of particular companies and they it's very important to advise them that even though they're collaborating and this is for the greater good that they should still be aware that there are certain um, aspects of information that uh, should may should potentially be withheld, or uh, at least uh, if you're going to disclose it to a group of collaborators, to advise that they that information is uh, proprietary, it's confidential, and it could be used for the purpose of developing a vaccine. But other than that, it should not be used for a comp uh, personal uh, company. Uh, product development. So um, while companies are trying to share IP and collaborate, um, there, there are risks out there. So for example, um, there's a tremendous amount of federal funding uh, that the NIH, among other organizations, is providing. So when you think about that, oftentimes when there's federal funding involved, uh, that uh, information, part of that uh, agreement to receive that funding is that you're going to provide information related to uh, the studies that you're conducting with that funding. So that could jeopardize trade potential trade secrets. Um, when you think about uh, sharing information outside of the company, it's oftentimes uh, worth talking ahead of time to scientists to identify what are the company's trade secrets, not necessarily, as I mentioned, to uh, prevent the scientists from sharing them, but potentially uh, to advise them that they should advise their collaborators that, you know, this is proprietary information of their company, that this is only being used for the, the good of this collaboration. Uh, in addition, uh, oftentimes when you, and this is true even outside the context of a COVID situation, um, make sure you consider chain of title issues because, uh, there could be these joint development arrangements and joint development agreements that create joint IP. Oftentimes, scientists that work for companies, uh, when they join companies, they assign, or excuse me, they sign employment contracts that assign their inventions. They include the language hereby does assign, uh, which is that magic language the Supreme Court said acts as an assignment of the inventions. Uh, so just uh, consider chain of title issues that could arise uh, with these collaborations. Uh, so what are some best practices to uh, to use during these collaborative IP initiatives? Well, certainly uh, the use of NDAs and confidentiality agreements is very important. 
but oftentimes, uh, you know, especially scientists who are not, their expertise is in the research and not necessarily in the legal aspects, they may think they sign the NDA or the other party signs the NDA and then they're free to collaborate on information. But one thing to keep in mind is that oftentimes NDAs do not include uh, what's considered proprietary information. They oftentimes have language that says something to the effect of um, anything, any statements that are shared or considered proprietary or confidential have to be identified as confidential or a trade secret at the time of disclosure. So it's very important to uh, consider uh, advising scientists that even though they and the companies that are collaborating may have executed an NDA, it's still necessary to uh, advise uh, other parties that you're collaborating with what information is considered a trade secret. It's not good enough that you only signed an NDA uh, because the, the information that's shared uh, may be considered confidential, but just to advise the person that it's confidential and it's also proprietary and a trade secret of the company. Um, the other thing is uh, to uh, advise scientists, and it's somewhat counterintuitive because I, I talk to scientists quite a bit, and oftentimes I talk to scientists uh, at smaller companies that collaborate with larger companies, and their instinct is to share data. Uh, they want to share this data to disseminate this information, uh, but it's, it's critical to ensure that what information is uh, shared is uh, only what's necessary. This is a especially true uh, if you're thinking about uh, a platform technology. So uh, for the development of this vaccine, one uh, member of a collaborative group may have may be contributing a proprietary platform technology that they use for their own drug discovery um, that you that in fact provides that company with a competitive advantage in and of itself. You don't want that information shared. Uh, you may want the results of that information shared, but you may not want the actual uh, information that is is proprietary to that platform technology shared to the group. So it's important to uh, advise scientists and researchers what information is acceptable to be shared, how it's to be shared, uh, and to advise them to mark things as confidential. And one last thing to consider is uh, the effects of uh, these partnerships, there's often these public-private partnerships or academic-private partnerships where you have uh, uh, academic institutes partnering with uh, biopharmaceutical companies. Uh, you should consider the effects of the Bayh-Dole Act. If these academic institutions uh, receive federal funding, uh, the government may have marching rights uh, that uh, typically uh, or have never been used, have never been exercised, but certainly in the current situation we're in now with the coronavirus, uh, if there was ever a situation where I can imagine that the government would come in and use these rights under the Bayh-Dole Act, it's in this situation. And the last point is uh, 28 U.S.C. 1498. Most people haven't heard of this, but it's a, a form of government immunity from patent claims. And what it does is it allows the federal government to use patented inventions without permission as long as they provide a reasonable comp uh, compensation. And that has very rarely been used. Uh, most people probably recall in the early 2000s with the uh, anthrax scares, uh, the, the U.S. did threaten to invoke 28 U.S.C. 1498 uh, in order to uh, uh, obtain stockpiles of ciprofloxacin uh, to treat anthrax, uh, they wound up not using it because the, the drug maker reduced the price, but it's just something that uh, should be considered that the government can, uh, it, there are statutes out there that will allow the government to come in and just uh, take patented information. So I'm going to uh, turn it back over to um, Kate, for this next slide, and I understand we have a few minutes left. Yeah, we have we have about six minutes left, so we're going to go pretty quickly. Unfortunately, obviously, we take more time than we need. But this, the next couple of slides really just talk about the competitive threat, uh, sort of ex external factors, and and we've all I'm sure seen the FBI and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency CISA issued a, a public service announcement not too long ago, warning 
uh, that the um, that China might uh, is likely targeting in network uh, networks as well uh, organizations that are re researching COVID-19, um, uh, and th they've got everybody uh, you know warned of this potential threat. Uh, and it's not just China; it's obviously that this this heightened time frame that we've talked about um, brings out. Um, competition at perhaps sometimes at its worst level where people are trying to either um, perhaps uh, access networks, um, improperly recruit uh, perhaps and, and target particular employees who have have been involved in these efforts. Um, so it's really just a <clears throat> it's another another worry for companies to, to be on notice of uh, and, and be certainly sensitive to um, their networks and their protocols in place. Um, you know, the press coverage, uh, all of the wonderful things that companies are doing are obviously bringing attention uh, to themselves. It's getting covered in the press as it should. Um, perhaps those, those particular press efforts are putting those companies at risk, and they should be particularly mindful of steps that they should be taking internally for their networks, um, way beyond my expertise um, or, or time enough to talk about all of this, but we list a couple of things on the slide here that, that talk about ways in which we uh, companies should be working with their IT experts uh, on additional measures to, to protect their, um, their systems um, you know, from hacking. Uh, and other access efforts from internal efforts as well of uh, employees. So I'm going to go to the next um, uh, section here, and just one of the other risks is uh, is the environment has caused a delay. You know, it causes delay in in seeking uh, protection or enforcement of particular rights, trade secret rights. Um, you know, Dawn mentioned the remote work uh, remote working conditions, layoffs, and furloughs. Um, there's lots of um, new laws and regulations spurred by COVID-19 dealing with remote workforces and bringing people back to work. Um, many of the courts have shut down uh, all, all procedures except emergencies. Um, and I think, you know, given those circumstances, companies may be, uh, you know, there might be an opportunity where they're taking their eye off the ball. Uh, so so that's, that's a particular challenge. And Julie, I don't know if you had anything to add to that particular piece from a from an in-house perspective. On the on the which piece, sorry, Kate, say that again. Uh, on uh, the the current environment and and uh, causing challenges and delays and enforcing rights. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks. Um, one of the questions when we were preparing for this talk, I asked the Cypher folks, is you know, um, what's happening in civil courts around the nation, and if you if you want to get a CRO, how how easy or hard is it is it um, at this time due to, due to COVID and, and various closures, because um, that was something that I hadn't really thought about. We're certainly accustomed to if something does come up, you know, on the civil side, very quickly we're able to act, retain counsel and act, um, because people desperately care about the status of the trade secret and they want to make sure that you jump on the opportunity once you learn about a potential theft so that you can save off any other negative consequences. Um, but this environment certainly um, makes that a little harder. Um, I'd, I'd also add that um, my experience is that law enforcement is very interested in trade secret cases. Um, and if you do believe that there has been criminal conduct, uh, in my experience, to contact federal law enforcement early in the case um, and, and share with them uh, some of the facts that have happened thus far, what you know thus far, um, and they might ask you to keep in touch with them or they might try to get involved right away because they have specific tools that could help you. Um, there, there might be tools that they have access to in order to learn information that you don't necessarily have access to. So I believe that option is still available too. Kate, I'll go back to you. Okay, very good. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, the courts are uh, still hearing emergency matters, but you might, you better have your, 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 it better be truly an emergency uh, and trade secrets are on their way out of the country or out the door. Um, and, and certainly for those matters, they are the courts are making themselves available. They've really responded pretty well, uh, given the environment. Um, I'm going to um, move on to the just those last few slides. I'm going to turn over to Dawn to take us through. A lot of these are principles that um, we've talked about. We're also going to make available, to the extent people are interested and want checklists on these particular areas, just reach out to us. We've got a number of things that we could provide, particularly on the last couple of slides having to do with audits. But go ahead, Dawn. 
Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, since we only have a, a minute or two left, I'll, I'll go through these pretty quickly. But as Kate said, you'll get the copies um, of these slides and we have checklists. Um, so feel free to reach out to us. You know, the, the key here, and this is always the case, but even more so in the COVID environment, the key is to be proactive rather than reactive. Um, so we recommend taking steps before a trade secret walks its way out the door um, to try to prevent that from happening and set the company up best to, um, to litigate if need be. That is going to be, um, part of that will be trade secret identification, um, which a lot of companies don't have their trade secrets identified in advance. That will be really important in litigation um, and also just to prevent um, misappropriations. The more you can explain to your employees um, what you consider a trade secret, the better luck you'll have in preventing that from being uh, disclosed. We've talked a lot about um, employment agreements, not just with employees, but also um, restrictive covenant agreements with partners and collaborators. Um, Dean talked a little bit about the, the unprecedented collaboration, so that will become really important here. Um, onboarding instructions and training, again, this is all stuff that you should be thinking about regardless, but especially in this environment, um, and protocols for employees that leave. Um, you know, there are things we should be doing on a daily basis, making sure that the most critical information is marked confidential, ensuring that your employees understand what is considered confidential, um, being consistent, um, that it's all important, um, especially in this environment when people are uh, remote and not in the office. Um, Kate, I don't know if you want to mention really quickly um, the trade secret audit piece. I know yeah, we're over the hour, a, but. Yeah, just real quickly, and we'll provide this, as I said. Um, an audit uh, can be what you want it to be. It really is an opportunity to, it's sort of an organized opportunity to, to make sure that you understand the trade secrets that exist in the organization and go department by department, start small and work uh, larger into a larger uh, plan for the organization, but it just it gets it gets your house in order so that you are prepared to um, defend these trade secrets and get into court quickly because it's a big part of our the, the litigation in this area is being able to identify them and, and support why they are a trade secret and demonstrate the particular measures that you've taken to protect them. So that's this is the steps in an audit and how to how to plan for it. Again, we'll make this available for you. Uh, we talked a lot about protecting against the rogue employee already, so we won't go to that. We've talked a lot about this as well. So uh, we've packed a lot in, um, but we hope uh, it's been helpful, and certainly we are available to answer any questions you may have, and we will make the slides and checklists I've mentioned available to those who have participated. So we appreciate your time today. We hope you are all well and that you and your loved ones remain safe uh, in this environment, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for attending, and we hope you have a great day.